scripture references on the overhead, and we're going to be in Exodus today. Exodus chapter 10. Moses is writing about this eighth plague that's going to plague Egypt, and he writes the following. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may perform these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I made a mockery of the Egyptians, and how I perform my signs among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory. They shall cover the surface of the land, so that no one will be able to see the land. They will also eat the rest of what has escaped, what is left to you from the hail. And they will eat every tree which sprouts for you out of the field. Then your houses shall be filled, and the houses of all your servants, and the houses of all the Egyptians, something which neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from this day, that they may come upon the earth until this day. And he turned and went out from Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh hurriedly called Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore, please forgive my sin only this once, and make supplication to the Lord your God, that he would only remove this death from me. He went out from Pharaoh and made supplication to the Lord. So the Lord shifted the wind to a very strong west wind, which took up the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. Not one locust was left in all the territory of Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the sons of Israel go. We're going to be looking at this passage out of Exodus chapter 10. Now, we're back into our series on uh, Moses' leadership, his series of dealing with his leadership and the freedom from uh, Israel. And I'm, I'm excited as we move through the end of these plagues, and we're about to go out into the wilderness, and uh, we're going to meet God at the... Uh, at the mountain, and we're going to see the commandments handed down to Moses and how those apply to us today as well, and how we might walk uh, that road as God has given us grace to do so. And so we've got a lot of territory to cover, and so we'll be in, in Exodus for quite some time, but we're excited to get back into that after a break. And so today we're going to look at the eighth plague uh, that God is bringing upon uh, the land of Egypt. Now, <clears throat> It's interesting that over these eight plagues, uh, Pharaoh has quite frankly resisted the Lord a lot. And it wasn't that still small voice that sometimes we get where God is starting to kind of move on our heart and say, hey, you need to do this or you need to move toward this direction or that direction. And sometimes we ignore it, sometimes we obey it. But I mean, this is in your face, up in your grill kind of thing because of these plagues. But for some reason, Pharaoh seems to think that he might be invincible. If I can just hang out longer than God, I can win this battle. And so he, he might have thought himself as invincible. If I could just hang on long enough, that will trip God up and he'll, we'll be able to be free from this thing. And I want us to talk about this whole idea of an invincibility because sometimes we in our culture think that we're immune to uh, the things going around us and that's, you know, especially our younger people, that they have this idea of invincibility, that they can just go out and conquer the world and do whatever they want to do. And then sometimes reality of gravity, the laws of science and nature catch up to them and uh, they're not so invincible. We are broken in our culture, and we are broken in our world, and then we are in need, uh, a great need of a Savior, and that Savior is the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the contemporary time, I want to share with you this idea of an invincibility of a young man who thought he could get away with some things. And his name is Philippe Petit, and he was a, a high-wire walker. And they made a movie about him called The Walk. And in 2015, this motion picture came out, and it chronicled his 
his time leading up to this great dream of his of stringing a wire between the two twin towers in New York and doing a high wire walk across between the two buildings. But in the process of walking up to this, that walking up to it, um, they chronicle his life and his history to getting to that point. Because you know, you just don't, you know, just, hey, one day I want to just throw a line between two buildings and walk across it. There's got to be a lot of practice. There's got to be a vision. There's got to be a goal. There's got to be practice. And the film talks about his younger days of practicing and where he found his self practicing is in the big top under the circus tent. And you know the high wire walkers and the swings and all that kind of stuff. Well, he wanted to sign up for that, and he had a mentor by the name of Papa Rudy. And Papa Rudy would never let him get up there on the high wire. I, for whatever reason, maybe he just didn't think he was ready or whatever, but he'd always sit back and say, this is how it's done, this is how you do it, how you walk, this is how you hold the pole and all that. And he, he inspired him and got him going. Well, one time in his history here, the circus had closed down and everybody had gone home for the night and he was there as the apprentice sweeping up and doing whatever apprentices do. And he looked up at the wire and he thought, I can do this. And so he grabs his pole and he climbs up the ladder to the high wire. Now remember, during the circus, there's no nets. And so he gets his pole and he gets himself out there on that and gets himself ready and he starts to walk across. And he's walking across and he's walking across and about the time he gets over to the other side, his mentor walks into the big circus tent. And there he is by himself. And as he gets to three steps away from the platform in which he was to stop, he takes a step and everything starts to go wobbly on him, and he tries to hurry and get to that point. And when he did, he's, his other leg slipped off, he drops the pole, and the only thing saving his life is he catches the line that he was standing on, and he's hanging there. So he's inching over, inching over, inching over, and climbs himself up, and then he climbs down with hat in hand, and there's his mentor, and his mentor looks at him, and he says the following words. Most wire walkers, they die when they arrive, meaning that it's not in the middle that you ever see a wire walker fall off. It's never right when they begin because their their senses are so honed and so sharp, and they know when they get to the middle of it, they're they're halfway home, and so they're, they're still sharp and they're moving, but it's when they get to the end, they begin to relax. And their mind wonders, I'm almost there. What am I going to, I think I'm going to eat me a Snickers when I get done here. Or I'm going to have a Coke because I'm going to celebrate. And their mind goes somewhere else. And he says, they die when they arrive. They think they have arrived, but they're still on the wire. If you have three steps to do, you take those steps arrogantly. And if you think you are invincible, you're going to die. And folks, just using that illustration about us is that sometimes we can concentrate on our faith journey and we can walk that way and we can talk with God and we're doing that and making it happen and then we think we got it. Say, God, I don't need you anymore. I got this. Let me have this. And then we think that we're invincible spiritually and the next thing you know, boom, something hits you out of nowhere. And God begins to humble you and draw you back. Pharaoh might have thought that he was invincible here. Maybe he thought he could outlast God. I do not know. But I do know one thing. We as humans cannot outlast our Heavenly Father, the God of all power, the Almighty God. We cannot outlast Him. And so therefore, as we approach this story and as we approach this idea of what God is doing in Egypt, I want you to know and understand that everything that God does in His Word and everything God brings to your life and that you walk through, good or bad, 
for his sovereignty's sake, there's an allowance for that to happen in your life. This journey that you and I are on, God, he's already seen it. He knows it. And so what we need to do is just step back and rest in what God is doing. And Pharaoh fought that. He could have been everything done in Egypt and just let the people go. But yet, God hardened his heart and Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And that's the tension we have between the sovereignty of God and man's free will. Those two, they do not clash. They're complementary, but they are held in tension in our world, in our biblical world. And you've got to understand that. There's some things that we just wrestle with and will not come to the conclusion with. And this is one of those. And as we approach this, I want you to know and understand that God in His sovereignty and the choices He's making to punish Pharaoh and the Egyptians fulfills a purpose that He has. God has a purpose in all of this. The grief that you have gone through has a purpose. The surgery that you have gone through or the brokenness or the funerals or the car wrecks or whatever it is in our life, those are there for a purpose. Remember that. They're there for a purpose. And as we approach this, I want you to understand here that the purpose of God is seen in the performance of the signs among unbelievers to help them see that God is real. Look what God says as Moses writes in Exodus 10.1, The Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I've hardened his heart and the heart of his servants. Why? He answers it right here, that I may perform these signs of mine among them. That's why I've done that. I want them to know that I am God. Now remember earlier on, the, the magicians, they were able to duplicate the miracles. Not anymore. Not anymore. God can only do what He's doing here. And so He is performing these signs and miracles. But I want you to understand, folks, God is not a capricious God, meaning that He just doesn't blow up and, you know, blow off the handle and just say, boom, it's going to happen. He is calculated, it is settled, and it is sovereign in all of His decisions. God is. He is not capricious. He's not volcanic in terms of blowing up. And when God does these signs, I think they serve two purposes. The first purpose I think they saw they, that it fulfilled, is it means to draw people to himself. God wants people to come to him. Look at the book of Revelation. If you look at that book, God is bringing judgment upon the land. Judgment, judgment, judgment. Why? He wants people to come back to him. But what do they want to do? They want to run for the hills, hide in the caves, and let the rocks fall on them. Rather than me submit to a living God. And that's the world we live in. Because we're going to talk about humility here in a moment. I think the other purpose that signs are done among unbelievers is that it repels them from God. It hardens their heart. It shows how prideful they are and they will not humble themselves before the living God. It just exposes their pride is really what it does. And so as we approach this, I want you to understand here, for us as contemporary believers, that we must take to heart this scripture in 1 Peter 5. You younger men likewise be subject to your elders and all of you, all of you, Church, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. We are to be a church body that walks in humility toward one another. There should not ever be pride or hubris whatsoever in the body of Christ. Yes, yeah, some have been in the faith longer. Sure, some of us are educated a whole lot more than the person sitting in the pew, but it doesn't give me any right to say, hey, I'm, the, I'm better than you. Forget that. It's ridiculous. We are to clothe ourselves with humility toward one another. Why should we do that? Peter answers the question. Because God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. 
You want to be opposed by God? Then be prideful. He will oppose you in your marriage. He will oppose you in your business. He will oppose you in your relationships to your kids and your grandkids and everybody else. He will oppose you. But if you're humble, He is going to extend grace to you. He will extend grace in your marriage. He will extend grace in your parenting. He will extend grace to your extended relatives. God bless them. He will extend grace to your business. All of that if you humbly walk with Him. And notice further it says that He may exalt you. Therefore, humble yourselves under His hand so that He will exalt you at His time, not yours. See, we all want to run ahead of God. God, come mess this, you know, bless this mess that I'm in. That's not the way God operates. We find where He's working and then go join Him. We don't run ahead and say, God, catch up. You're headed for a cliff, bro. Stop. Be humble before the living God. The second purpose of God that we see of why is happening here, it's that's for a history lesson for us. Folks, we are in a time right now where we have a generation of kids coming up that don't believe that the Holocaust of the Jews at the hands of the Nazis actually happened. Can you believe that? Six million people were wiped off the face of the earth. History tells us that. But yet there are a generation that doesn't believe that and more and more are embracing that. And you have all heard the adage, those who do not learn from history are doomed to what? Repeat it. And I want to tell you this, don't, church, don't teach history, don't talk about it, don't embrace it, and guess what? In two or three generations from now, guess what you're going to have on your hands? Another holocaust. And you're going to have six million people wiped off this planet. And you know what's going on right now? It's happening right now because we're aborting our babies in our country. It's ridiculous. Abraham Kuyper said this, A church which does not teach her youth can never hope to retain a confession, that is, an ongoing belief, but relinquishes it, cuts off all contact with the past, divorces herself from the fathers, that is, the faith fathers in the past, and forms a new group. A new group of what? Dumb Christians who don't know their history, don't know their doctrine, don't know who they are in Christ, don't know the joys of grace and the horrors of hell. If you desire to confess, you must learn. You must learn. Learn from the past. Learn what the church fathers did. Learn what Jesus and the disciples did. Learn what Moses did to follow the Lord, even his, his time, which is ancient time back then. Learn from them. Folks, we need to be able to teach the next generation. God commanded His people in Deuteronomy, in the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In the Shema, He teaches them and tells them, Teach the next generation. And where does that teaching take place? It takes place first and foremost where? In the home. Christian parents, teach your kids. Christian grandparents, teach your grandkids about the faith. Walk uprightly. Do justice and love God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Verse 7. You shall teach these commandments diligently to your sons. Talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down at night and when you rise up in the morning. Let this be always the thought of what God is doing among His people. And a little bit further down in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 20, notice in verse 24, it says, The Lord commanded us to observe 
all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always and for our survival. That's why we do what we do. Maybe your child or grandchild is asking, what's this Bible all about? Well, what's the Ten Commandments and why do we adhere to them and why do we watch over them and why do we do these things? Why do we go to church? Why, 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 why? You don't you just love kids at that age? Man, sometimes they're irritating, but you know what? From an educator's point of view, that is a beautiful thing. You know why? Because they're curious and they want to know. You know, you can either do two things there. You can go, little Johnny and Janie, get away from me because I'm tired of hearing the whys. Or you can be patient and stop long enough and bend down on your knee and begin to answer those questions. Answer those questions because it's important to the next generation. Because you're going to lose out, church, if you don't educate the next generation. And the third area here of why God brings the locusts is to point to His character. Is to point to His character. Notice at the end of verse 6, how I make a mock, or verse 3, how I make a mockery of the Egyptians and how I perform my signs among them that they may know that I am the Lord. God is bringing these things to say, you know what, this is me. I'm doing this. Your gods are not. I'm doing this. And character is important. You need to make sure you know who you worship and who you follow. In Leviticus chapter 11, I want you to notice the character qualities of God here. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy. This is you. Be holy. Why? Because I'm holy, God says. That's my nature. I am a holy God. Look at verse 45. I am the Lord who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy, for I am holy. And look at the roles and character references from Isaiah 43. I am the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, the Holy One, the Creator of Israel, and King. This is who God is. And when you're the Creator, the Lord, and the King, guess what? You get to do whatever you want to do, and you don't get a say in it. Sorry, you just don't. That's what sovereignty is. And when God makes the decisions, then so be it. And we just say, yes, Lord, and move on. And we trust Him in His economy. Then we look at our text here, and from verses 3 to 6, there is this giant flashing red warning sign that's coming to Egypt. Warning, warning, they are coming. It's going to happen, bro. If you don't let my people go, here's what's going to happen. Tomorrow, at this time tomorrow, you're going to be invaded, and it's not going to be by an army of a military might of a country. It's going to be the locusts. And you know what? Guess what? Pharaoh, they're coming. They're coming. Look at that face. That's a face only a mother could love. That is one ugly creature. That is ugly. You ever, how many of you like grasshoppers go out in the field and play around with them? You know what? Here's, I know, here's what you guys do. Some of you, you go out there and you grab them, still have their wing, and you pull off their giant legs. <laughs> pull them off, right? Some of you go fishing with them, hook them up, throw them in the, you know, bass would love one of those big old giant things and whatnot. I know you do. You're sitting there chuckling about it. We all have done that. Can you imagine, you know, when I was a kid... <laughs> When I was a kid, ripping the legs off of that wood, it's like, dude, what if somebody just reached down and just snatched you and tore both your legs off? How would that feel? I didn't think about it that way. But oh well, <laughs> you're pulling the legs off, right? Let me give you a little bit of facts about locusts. Because a locust is not a grasshopper. They are related, but they're not the same. We have grasshoppers here in the Midwest they have locusts over in Africa and the Middle East. And let me give you a little bit of facts about the locusts. Now, one little locust, little, kind of about that big, isn't really damaging. It's just kind of cute. You know, maybe cute. I don't know. That's a face a mother can love, right? Maybe not so cute. But when you get a bunch of these guys together, it's destructive. And listen how destructive these things can be. A locust swarm can contain 
billions of insects that would contain one to two hundred million of these things per square mile. That is a lot of bugs. I don't think you have enough raid in your cabinet to kill off that many bugs. In the 1920s and 30s, locusts wiped out 5 million square miles of Africa. Listen to that. 5 million square miles of Africa. That's double the size of the United States. Take two United States, and that's how much in 10 years the locusts have wiped out in the 20s and 30s. In 1988, the locusts were so thick in northern Africa that the sun was blotted out and it looked like a black crawling carpet along the ground. Can you imagine that for a minute? You open your door and they all just come rushing in. Welcome! Want a piece of cheese? In 2001, the Times in London reported a locust swarm containing the density of the insects that measured, in some places, 10 thousand locusts per 10 square feet. And then through the science of extrapolation, they could get the size of the swarm itself. Can you imagine square, 10 square feet and then 10,000 bugs in that square feet? I would not want that in my house. Each locust, each one of those little bugs can eat its weight in plants each day. So a swarm the size that we have just talked about would eat 423 million pounds of plant matter in one day. That is a lot of plant matter in one day. And this is what God unleashed on Egypt. But here's the thing, folks. Egypt's crops had already been so torn up by the hail that there was hardly any viable uh, growth. And so right on top of the hail came the locusts. So you got, got all the new sprouts that were coming up just hammered by the hail, and then the swarms come in and finish it off. So much so that it set Egypt's economy back for years to the point where they were starving, famine, and they became an importer of food instead of an exporter of food. That's how damaging this was to their economy. And only God could do this. Only God. He brought judgment upon Egypt. He wants them to let his people go. And Pharaoh starts down the road of repentance and then backs out. And so that's what I want to talk about here is a the locust, the purpose of the locust was to really expose Pharaoh's heart. Remember earlier I said when difficulty comes that it can either push us toward God where we embrace him or it repels us. Well, Pharaoh kind of tried to do a dance. He kind of danced down the road toward maybe God and then he veered off and went toward selfishness and pride. And we see this aspect of false repentance. Because he calls in Moses and Aaron in verse 16 and says, I have sinned against the Lord and you. Verse 17, I find this kind of comical in verse 17. Now, therefore, please forgive my sin only this once. Ask a question of yourself right there. Only once? Really? What about tomorrow? A week from now? You just want this one time? Pharaoh, really? You know, folks, sometimes we are like Pharaoh. Because we're, through our choices in life, we get ourselves sideways with God. We think that we can do some things on the side, in the dark, away from all prying eyes that nobody sees. But I want to tell you something, God's there. And whatever you're doing, you're dragging Jesus right in there with it. Oh God, please forgive me this one time and I will never do this again. Really? 
All of us have prayed those prayers like that. We all have. Because you know why? You approach God in this way. You approach God in repentance and you hold your hand up and say, God, I want you to forgive me of this sin, but secretly behind your back you're holding on to the sin. And you're really not repentant. You're just fooling yourself that you are, and God knows your heart. Don't be like Pharaoh. Don't be like Pharaoh. When you repent and are going to be holy and righteous and walk before the Lord truly, then do it. Don't play games with God. He already knows your mind and your heart. Don't play games with God. You cannot play games with God. What does God look for? He looks for the fruit of repentance in our lives. Are you serious about what you have just stated? Are you really real about this? Are you truly repentant? Two scripture references in Matthew chapter 3 that comes from the voice of John the Baptist and the Apostle Paul. John the Baptist is down at the river near Aon and he's baptizing because there's a lot of water there. The Pharisees and the Sadducees hear what's going on down, and they want to come, and they hear the call of repentance. And so they rush down to where John's at, and they want to, they want to be baptized. And look what John calls them up there. What does he call them? Brood of vipers. Man, when somebody calls you a brood of vipers, man, that just kind of like, that doesn't stick too nice, does it? Because you know how vipers are. They're slithery and poisonous, and if it bites you, they infect you, it's just dangerous. This is what he calls these guys. And then look what he says here. Who warned you to flee the wrath that is to come? So therefore, because wrath is coming, therefore, I want you to show me your true repentance and bring forth fruit and keeping with that decision. That's what God calls us to do. Are you really, really sorry? Then show me. Show God that we're really, really sorry. And Paul says, when he was standing before King Agrippa after he got arrested, he's on trial and he's headed toward Rome, and he's standing before this king, and he's talking about his missionary endeavors, planting churches and what he does when he plants church and what he calls people to. And he says, I was not disobedient to the vision that God had given to me on the road to Damascus. I preached the gospel in Damascus, and I also went down to Jerusalem and I preached it there and throughout all the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles. Here was my message, King Agrippa, that people should repent Turn to God and bear fruit in keeping with that repentance. Show us. Perform deeds that show that you're real. Do you really love your wife or your husband? Then show them. Do you really love God? Then show Him and walk in that journey with Him. Bring forth those deeds of repentance. Really what it boils down to is just be the church. Be the church that God called you to be. We all individually make up the church, but God has called us together in community. And one of the ways that you can be the church is up here you see all of these purple and gold things that are up here, and you kind of wonder, what in the world is all this? Well, all of this is not litter, and it wasn't something left over from Matt and I while we were here in the, in the sanctuary. This was from Vision Night last week. And what we have up here are areas that people have vision about in terms of areas of ministry that we need people to be involved in. And it's anywhere from uh, prayer needs to a cleanup crew here at the church that can go up in these pockets of areas in our church that stuff has not seen the light of day since Moses was around and needs to go out north between us and Winfield. 
if you know what I mean. There's places, uh, Awana, there, there's all kinds of stuff up here. What we're just calling you, the saints, to come and just be the church. It's just be the church and get involved. Plug holes where they're needed that have sprung out of our vision night together. And who knows, from this, more vision will come. But we have to do this collectively together because Matt and I can't do all this. There's no way on God's green earth that we can do all this. We need help. And we need to see the vision flourish here at First Baptist Church. Well, let me give you some application points other than being the church here and signing up on some things. Let me give you some applicable points from our message this morning that you can be part of as you re, uh, uh, rehash these uh, uh, sermon and the, and the scripture reference. Look them over and read them again. First of all, are you rehearsing your Christian history and telling the story? You know, history has been dubbed his story. Are you telling his story? We have a time that we've programmed into our time slots here, and we haven't had it in a while, but we want to hear life stories. We want to hear your story. How does God work in your life? Because the saints need to hear that. What have you struggled with, and what have you had a journey of overcoming, and how has God ministered to you in that moment? We want to hear those stories. Secondly, are you heeding the warning signs of God? That still small voice, or maybe it's that very loud, man, I'm out of sorts, I'm not uh, at peace with this decision I'm trying to make. Those are the things God's trying to help you understand and walk in His ways. Remember, it's not God come bless my mess, it's God we need to find where you're working and go join Him. Find that out. And then thirdly, are you being humble before God and your fellow man is the church. Be humble. Part of that humility is serving. Be a servant toward other people who might be in charge of a ministry, or you be in charge of a ministry.